title of the message today is Choice, Chance, and Change. Choice, Chance, and Change. And I'll kind of give you uh, an un- more of an understanding of the title of the message today uh, just before the end of the message. I know it's a little, little different, but uh, just hang in there with me if you would. One of the things that I found concerning over the last 25 years um, in ministry, and especially over the last 10 to 15 years in ministry, is the absence of a Christian worldview. Now, you may say, well, of course... There is an absence of a Christian worldview in the world. But I'm not talking about the world. I'm talking about us. There is an absence of a Christian worldview in, within the body of Christ, within the church of Christ. And that's because just because someone goes to church doesn't mean they agree with God. Now, I will admit, um, I've been in church since I was six days old. It's the truth. I was on the concrete pad of a church when they were building it, and they had the the dedication service. Um, I remember it well. (laughs) Because my mama told me. And I I was there. I was six days old. They had the dedication service. And I, I was there for eight and a half years after that, hearing the gospel for eight and a half years and living in a a Christian-based, Christian worldview home before I accepted Christ when I was eight years old. So it wasn't the fact that I went to church that gets me to heaven. It is the blood of Jesus that gets me to heaven because I believe that he died to pay for my sins. I have trusted that to pay for all of my sins, past, present, and future, by the way. Because when I was eight and a half, I had no idea of any sins I would commit beyond that day. But God is outside of time. And God knew. And when he said you are saved, when he made that proclamation, for me and everyone who has been saved, the proclamation is that I have saved your life. And I have saved your lifetime. So, I accepted Christ. But just because someone goes to church doesn't mean they believe what God has told us in his word. And I've been amazed over the past 25, 26 years in ministry, and especially over the last 20 or 15 years, how many folks within the body of Christ that you could very easily assume, and we make this assumption by mistake many times, by the way, that because someone is a church member or even a believer, uh, that they automatically have a Christian worldview. This world leads us astray. And the, world, the reason that the world leads us astray is because the world is made out of you and me. We are human beings. And we not only mess ourselves up, we mess each other up. And we do that because we don't look to God and God's Word and His Holy Spirit guiding us. We don't look to that all the time to give us our worldview. Many times, we, if mom and daddy says it, we just believe it. If grandma used to say it, we just believe it. And so I'm thankful that I grew up in a Christian home with Christian grandmas and Christian granddaddies. I'm blessed and Christian aunts and uncles. I mean, I'm so overwhelmingly blessed. But I am smart enough to know after hanging out with folks for all these years to realize that not everybody in God's church believes what God says. And it kind of amazes me on the one hand, but on the other, I understand. Because we want to trust the people that we trust. But I'm here to tell you today that you could never trust anyone that's going to guide you 100% correctly other than God. I will always do my best for you, always. Jim will always guide you the best that we can. But at the end of the day, you need to hear us say that I've prayed about this and the best way I can tell you, this is what God says. But beware when it's just simply our opinion. And we all have opinions, but God's word settles it. I want to be crystal clear that the news doesn't settle it. Facebook doesn't settle it. Instagram doesn't settle it. I don't care if out of 
8.37 billion people on the earth if 8.36 agree with one thing. If God doesn't agree, then it's wrong. And it's not just about right and wrong. Many times we feel like, and I understand this, and it's justifiable, we feel like God's word is all about telling us what's right and wrong. But in the passage we're going to look at today, we're going to see that God's word is going to give us some amazing, incredible theological facts. Now when I say the word theological, that just means the study of God. We're going to put it in very basic terms because God puts it in basic terms for us. He's going to tell us, God himself is going to tell us through his word inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, God is going to tell us today who Jesus is. He's also going to tell us today who we are. In God's word, he tells us that at different times, he's spoken to us, mankind, in different ways. You know, in the Garden of Eden, God would actually come down in the cool of the day and he would walk around and hang out with Adam and Eve. How do we know that? The Bible says it. We know that that's what he did. How amazing would that be? But you know, heaven is sort of a, a prototype. It's an earthly um, sort of a, an idea or an ideal of what heaven is one day going to be like. And so Adam and Eve hung out with God and that's how he spoke to them then. But then when we get to the New Testament and even after the garden, God is no longer coming down to walk with man in the cool of the day. Now there's a problem, there's sin. And so God's got a plan. Ever since the foundation of the world was, was, was made before that, we're told in Ephesians, that God knew that mankind would fall and he already made a way for it to be okay in eternity. It's not always okay on this earth. A lot of times for believers, things aren't okay. We get in traffic accidents. We fall down. People we love get sick. People we love are ill. We struggle with addictions. We struggle with all of these different things, financial issues. Just because you're a believer doesn't mean the world gets better. It means now you're a target for Satan, but faith gets us through. And we can have faith in God's word because the Bible says it's God breathed. Think about, about that for just a moment. Now, again, I'm really talking to believers here today, and I know that well, but when we get to this passage in just a minute, I hope that if you're here and you've never accepted Christ, that simply, not my voice, but the words of God will penetrate your heart. And that you'll recognize maybe that today Jesus is knocking on your heart, just like he did mine, just like he did many of you, and that you will respond to that. Not so that you can be perfect, not so that your life can be perfect, but so that you can recognize that how much God loves you and wants eternity with you and not without you. So God speaks to us in different ways. Sometimes God speaks very softly to us in his word, and he tells us how much he loves us. It's not unusual to read that in God's word. Sometimes he speaks powerfully about his justice and his judgment. And sometimes God speaks very compassionately to us about his overwhelming mercy that he tells us in Lamentations is made new every single morning. Today we're looking at a passage that speaks to us very much like Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God, that is got to be one of the top two most powerful statements in all of the Bible. And if you were to break it down, actually what it says is, before the beginning, God was. Before the beginning, God was. He is outside of time. But this passage also includes that we're going to read today, it includes a proclamation about the ultimate one, the one, Jesus, God's only son in whom God says he is well pleased. Let me talk about this for just a second. I want to talk to you about, you can't talk today in 2024 
about a Christian worldview without talking about the enemy of a Christian worldview. Now, I want to say before I get into this that some of you may hold um, this view. And if you do, I am not here to beat you up. I promise you, I'm not. I've prayed about this message. I've studied for it. And I want God's best for you, but I can never want it more than God wants his best for you. So I'm going to share the truth with you today. And if you say, well, Kevin, I just, I just don't believe that. You can. You can. I'm not trying to beat you up. But if we don't tell the truth from the pulpit, if we don't tell the truth as Christians, as Christians, if we don't have a Christian worldview, then who will? challenge for the church has never been greater. We can't just say, I believe what God says. At some point, we need to know why we believe what God says. So I'm going to share this, this view with you, these couple of views. And then as believers, this is an encouragement and a message for you so that you can go back and listen to it online later or listen to the audio or take pieces out of it or write notes if you want, whatever you want to do so that you can not only be able to say, yes, I have a Christian worldview, but you can say, here's why. Because God says this about the world and God says this about himself and God says this about, my, about me. A couple of views I want to talk about real quick are evolution and the Big Bang. And I'm going to sum both of these up kind of um, in one statement because they both depend on the same understanding um, and this one statement covers it. And that is this, if given enough time, heat, and pressure, nothing will become something. If given enough time, heat, and pressure, Nothing will become something. Now, it's interesting to me the way that man is designed. I've been told by missionaries that if you go into the deepest, darkest parts of the world, into the deepest part of the jungle where no electricity has ever been seen, you will find people living and you will find things in those jungles that they worship. This is no mistake. No one from the outside world had to go into the jungle and say, hey, you guys, as, a, as, a, as human beings, you need to worship something. Nobody has to tell them. You know why? Because we're designed to worship. It's interesting to me that the worldview that the world tends to have believes that it's time, heat, and pressure that bring something out of nothing. When it is not time, heat, and pressure, it is God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is not an argumentative point. This is a truth. This is a fact. And if your God is time, heat, and pressure, it's easy for you to believe that something could come from nothing by those three things. Time, heat, and pressure may be the foundation of, an, of a godless worldview, but time, heat, and pressure didn't die on a cross to pay for your sins. And one day, everyone on earth will, will be before the Lord, and either we will be covered in his blood, our sins will be covered by his blood, and, and we will be forgiven, and when God looks at us, he'll see Jesus. And Jesus will say, Kevin's with me. And the father will say, I know, come on in. But if you go before the Lord, and I'm not saying this to beat you up, I'm telling you the truth. You don't want to put your face before God Almighty at his feet, and trust me, you will. And claim that time, heat, and pressure are the creator. In Romans chapter 1, it tells us that what may be known of the attributes of God are made evident in his creation. He's talking about the trees and the sky and the water and the sun and the stars and the galaxies that we're now able to see 
so far out and see millions of galaxies with telescopes. And guess what? God made every one of them. Thank you. God made every one of them. It wasn't time or heat or pressure. Consider this for just a moment. If you start with all the individual pieces of a watch in the same place at the same time, will it become a watch one day with enough time, heat, and pressure? Think about this for just a moment. I'm not even asking you to consider the Lord at this moment. I'm not asking you to consider Jesus. I'm asking you to use the common sense that God Almighty created in you. Can I see that first picture, Rick? This is a picture of a Big Bang. This is actually what it looks like when stars explode. This is what it looks like. Now I want you to look at this next picture. Now look at that picture. Now, Rick, back up to the other one. Do you really put your faith in time, heat, and pressure to go from this to go to that. You have way more faith than I could ever have. You have more faith, if you believe that, you have more faith than any Christian that I've probably ever met. Because for me, it's so easy to stand in front of an ocean or on top of the tallest mountain in North Carolina and I've had the privilege to do both thanks to my mom and dad and I've done both and looked out and all I have seen is the glory of God's creation. If you have enough faith to believe that, trust me, it takes so much less faith to believe what God is telling you in your heart right now. Now, that that blast did not build that watch. It also didn't build every cell in your body. And if you think that that watch looks complicated and incredible, there's only, only a couple thousand pieces to that watch. The human cell is a factory. Every living cell of every living thing on earth, every cell is a factory that can replicate itself Every 24 hours. That watch was built to be a watch and it will be that watch until it rusts and blows away. It'll never, it'll never regenerate itself. It can't fix itself. Your cells can. I want to show you a picture of something in just a second that to me is so incredible. And we've only been able to do this in the last, just the last few, few, few short years. At the radio station where I'm at sometimes, we have to record things. And when we record something, and maybe some of you have seen this even on your iPhone, you can record something and you can see your voice. That's called a time signature. It's zigzaggy looking. That's called a time signature. It's very uneven, but it is the sound your voice makes. And it's turned into electricity and through a program that man has come up with on a computer, we can see what our voice sounds like. Now, this is interesting, but when Mac and I record our radio show, I can look at a track, and most of the time, I can tell you if it's my voice on that time signature or Mac's because they look different. There's a little bit of difference to them. I want to show you something so amazing right now that, that your parents and grandparents couldn't see. Rick, let's look at that. This is the sound. This is the audio signature of one of your cells. That's what it looks like. If you saw a picture, an an audio signature of my voice, like I said, it would go up and down very quickly. And it would look very uneven. 
remember the bang that you saw a minute ago, the blast that you saw. And remember a simple watch that was made by a watchmaker, like my great uncle was. And remember those gears and how intricate they looked, but it's not all that many pieces. But look at the beauty of the audio signature of one of just one of your billions of cells. Look at the symmetry of it. And then consider what that cell is able to do. It is able to fix itself. It is able to replicate itself. And one of the other interesting things is that there are, and some of you in here in the medical field understand this way more than I do, but there are only so many amino acids. And in order to have life, those amino acids have to be lined up in the exact order. And if they're not, it kills itself instantly. Well, first of all, somebody had to create the amino acids. And second of all, how did they arrange themselves so that life could be possible? They didn't. They didn't. Faith isn't difficult. Because if you listen to the world long enough, you're called on to believe that the silliest things are true. But if you have ever looked into the eyes of a baby, especially your own, if you've ever held the hand of your parent when you're little, then you understand what love is. You get it. You understand love. That big bang can't create love. Time, heat, and pressure cannot create love. That comes from the one the Bible says, God says, is love. The Bible says that God is love. You don't have an explosion with a bunch of rocks in outer space and end up with a watch or a cell or the ability to love someone and be loved by someone. I'm not asking you to have a greater faith. I'm asking you to have true faith in Christ. Leave the time and the heat and the pressure to the world. I'm going to read this passage and then I'm going to close and we'll finish this message next week. Colossians 1, 13 through 18, and then we'll close. For God has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. For God has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us as believers and brought us into the kingdom of the Son that He loves, in whom we have redemption. And here's the key, and here's where we'll close until next week. In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Have you called on Jesus to be saved? I don't, I'm not asking you, did you join a church? I'm not asking you, have you jumped through a bunch of religious hoops? I'm not asking you, did you take a course on how to be religious? I'm not asking you any of those things. I don't care. I'm asking you, have you done what the Bible says? Jesus said, come to me like a child. When my little one-year-old grandson comes to me and wants something, he can't even speak yet. But he points to the cookie on the table. He points to his little cup on the chair. And I know what he needs. 
when we come to Christ as a sinner lost without Christ, when we come to him, he knows what we need. And he has promised to rescue you from the dominion of darkness. We'll do the invitation different today. I'm not going to ask the band to come up. We're just going to pray. When we're done with the service, if you'd like to come accept Christ, I want you to come talk to me. And if there's more than one person standing here, wait a minute. Because I don't want you to walk out of this building through those doors and get in your car and not be saved. Because God loves you so much he does not want to spend eternity without you. So just bow your head and close your eyes. Keith, if you just play this song, I'm going to pray. And after this, I'm actually going to pray, and then Keith will play the song. I'm going to pray, and then we'll be done for the day. You can get up and go. But I'm going to be here. If your blood isn't covered, if your sins aren't covered by the blood of Christ, I'm going to be right here. I'm going to be right here. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you that not only did you see sin coming, but you have told us in your word that even before the beginning of time, you made a way. You fixed it. You solved the problem. You built the bridge. You paid the debt through Christ. And Father, I pray for anyone in this building who has not accepted Christ or anyone online within the sound of my voice, Father, that you would impress upon them that you are the answer. The only worldview is the view you have given us. Not only because it's true, but because it reminds us that in this gigantic world of all the galaxies and stars, of all of your creation, that each and every human being that's ever lived, you have let us know that our value is beyond anything we could compare. You did not trade all the galaxies to save us. You traded the one person who was more important than any creation. You traded Jesus for us. You have told every person through your word and even through our hearts that we are the apple of your eye, that we are the ones that you have died for. I pray today, Lord, that no one will spend eternity without you after hearing your words and this message and your truths today. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.